Today's podcast is presented by Podgo. Podgo is the easiest way for you to monetize your podcast, providing podcasters with a flat rate for ad space so you always know how much you get when you include an ad from Podgo. Apply today to become a member and immediately be connected with advertisers that fit your audience. That's podgo.co at P-O-D-G-O dot C-O. And be sure to add Booze and Spirits podcast in the How Did You Hear About Podgo section of the application. Have you ever uh, heard of the Nuzzle House podcast? Nah, probably not. Which is why I've decided to stand here in the middle of this cow pasture holding this creepy music box because they were the uh, only sound effects I could find on the internet to tell you about it. Let me, a divorced man recording in my basement, read you tales you were uh, never going to read yourself anyway. Join the One Man Book Club and steal my opinion so you too can sound like you have a unique opinion on literature. You can find my podcast at nuzzlehouse.com or look for Nuzzle House on your podcast app of choice. Ah, uh, beautiful, aren't they? Should we go? Yes, I'm ready to party. I'm ready to party! Andrew WK in the house. When it is time to party, we will party hard. He's engaged to like Amber Tamblin or somebody. I don't remember if that's that accurate. My my party condom? I couldn't tell what that was. Is it actually a condom? No, it's... <laughs> wet wipes. Oh. I mean, that would probably do the job, just it probably wouldn't feel very good. I don't wear it, I just clean up after. Clean up before so you don't spread SVD. Mm, there we before go. and after, you should probably have two wet wipes. Dip my dick in bleach. Tea tree oil. <laughs> It's the Booze and Spirits Podcast. Woo! I have apples in my mouth already. <laughs> Too back. Too back here. It's like apples in your mouth with death. Death breath and apples. A drinking. The drink with death. <laughs> Yay! I'm Nick McDonald. I'm Kate McDonald. And I did brush my teeth, so I don't really have death breath. Well, it's good because we are recording this episode in uh, smell of it. So. Yes. Scratch and sniff. <laughs> That's right. Mail in for your scratch and sniff card, and when we tell you to scratch section one, scratch it, and you'll be able to smell what we're talking about. Which I think at this point would just be the alcohol on my breath, which is also <laughs> apple scented. Ooh, so clever. So people smell the alcohol, and you can just say it was apples. You know, I know people are really excited to take their masks off, and I'm not going to lie, like, I'm pretty excited too, because working in a mask over 80 degrees is, is really bad. Like, I don't enjoy it. Yeah. I can still breathe. But I really don't enjoy it. But people are going to be able to, like, smell the alcohol on my breath when I'm in public and, like, <laughs> actually be able to confirm that I'm giving them a go-fuck-yourself look. It's, it's not good. <laughs> it's not good. This has been great for my resting bitch face. I feel like my voice is scratchy today. Could be wrong. I've had a cold. Is it the Rona? I hope not. I'm... Did, did you get it from the vaccine? I might have. I hear, I hear the vaccine makes people sick. It gave me 5G and I downloaded it off the internet. Uh-huh. When I was trying to download a hoagie. Thought you were going to say a hooker. <laughs> I'm just trying to download a hooker. I don't know what's wrong with you people. You wouldn't steal a hooker. But I'm going to get hook hands for the gym. Okay, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Transitioning. <laughs> or segue. No, I don't even know. We've got to the point where I'm just, I just think that our really bad segues are just part of the show now. We're are unable to segue into our... You know what? It works in my head. I'm sorry. I thought it was charming. I thought it was our, it was our thing, but if you're not into it, I mean that's that's what they say about those McDonald kids. We're just charming as fuck, and we don't let a thing like tact get in the way. That's that's more of what they say. <laughs> well, we decided on this episode to, to gaslight me. No, to talk about noise, 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 noise. Longtime listeners of our show are well aware of noise because every week is a roulette table of what's the audio problem going to be. I was just going to say <laughs> that our stories just come out as noise. My children are being noisy right now. They're being very noisy to tell me that they're going to leave so they don't make noise. Are you sure it's your children? Maybe you have a poltergeist. No. It was, it was a good shot. Yeah. 
So I had a couple noisy stories. I tasked you with coming up with a noisy story and God forbid a noisy drink. Have you ever Googled noisy ghost stories? I have not. It's a bad idea. <laughs> Did you end up in a dark corner? Uh, no, <laughs> it's just like, they were, it was not useful. It's fine. <laughs> I have a story. I'll probably tell it. <laughs> well, I got two, so why don't I get one of mine out of the way first? For the love of God. <laughs> right. This is a rather recent story. This is the story of Daffodil Dawn. Is that so Dawn the, with a D-A-W-N or a D-O-N? It's a D-O-N. Daffodil Dawn. Is that like Tiny Tim tiptoeing through the tulips? No? <laughs> it is not. That's disappointing. I don't know if it's still on Shudder. They, they, they did have a uh, horror film on Shudder where Tiny Tim was... I can't remember if he was the killer or he was the red herring. I can't remember. I feel like I've heard of this. I mean... Tiny Tim in a horror film. It's a <laughs> an upsetting fit. <laughs> is it? Is it upsetting? Or is it logical? Six and one. Yeah. So, when the uh, owners of the Daffodil Bowl bowling alley in Puyallup, Washington, got hit by the pandemic, they knew they'd have to adapt to business in a whole new world. But what they didn't expect was that that adaptation would involve welcoming a ghost into their business. Do the Puyallup. Oh, man. That was a thing, wasn't it? For those of you playing along at home, Puyallup is where the Washington State Fair takes place. That is its claim to fame. Other than that, there's not a whole lot going on. I think there's a mall. I think I met Jason Lee at the mall there, maybe? <laughs> I learned recently that Jason Lee is an expert photographer amongst his... I think family. that was his job before he was a skateboarder. I don't remember. Wasn't he a skateboarder as a teenager? Like I don't know. I don't remember when Jason Lee was a teenager. <laughs> before Mallrats. Yeah. And Puyallup is outside, we'll just go with outside of Tacoma for graphic, gra gr geologra geological, geological reasons. <laughs> I wish I was drunk. <laughs> Geographical reasons. Geographical. I'm going to move on. Daffodil Bull owner Brad Swartz had taken over the business three years ago, but he had no idea that his alley was harboring a ghost. It took the pandemic driving business down and extending closing hours to expose the Daffodil Bull's phantom bowler. For the first time in nearly a decade, the lanes were quiet, so the noise was just never really noticed before. But in the quiet of the pandemic, Swartz and his daughter Ashley began noticing that they could occasionally hear the sound of a ball rolling down the lanes, even if there were no bowlers in the building. The phantom roll seems to emanate primarily from lane number one and can occur as frequently as every 15 minutes at times. So he's hitting strikes every time, or does he well, roll I, twice? Like, I mean, they're just here, as near as I can tell, they're just hearing the ball. They're not hearing any pins, so. Well, I know, but if he's only going once every 50, like, he's, he would have another roll. Maybe. If he didn't strike it. Maybe. I mean, my bowling, my bowling terms are good. You like those? Yeah, those are good. I was, but if he's not hitting any pins, then he's guttering them all, right? Yeah, but then he would get to go again. You get to go well, twice. I mean, he would, but maybe he's too embarrassed. I don't know. Mm. Why are we trying to figure out what this ghost bowler's handicap is? What are we doing here? I just want to know <laughs> if he is a really good bowler or a really bad bowler. I don't know. Is he a league bowler? <laughs> he a casual bowler? Does he have an embroidered shirt? Does he have his own shoes? I have questions. Well, he must have his own ball, right? Because I don't think they reported any balls going missing. Ghost or balls. Or shoes. Or shoes. So he probably does have his own shoes. Ghost balls. Ghost balls. I just turned into brick from the middle. Ghost balls. Ghost <laughs> balls. Which is weird, because you were the one that did that as a kid. I was going to say, some of us used to repeat ourselves in whispers when we were little. Would thank you not to try to take that away from us. Okay, I'll, I'll stop trying to, to, <laughs> to fuck up your cabbage patch. Yeah, quit okay. trying to make my speech problems normal or whatever's going on here. So... After Swartz and his daughter mentioned it to some of the other employees, it became clear that they were the last ones to be in on the ethereal lanesmen. Just about every employee had a story about strange noises, shoes flying off the rack, or kitchen implements falling off the wall. Oh, because they, like, kept the employees when they bought yeah. it, I guess. Yeah, oh, okay. so they, they bought just, it. No one bothered to tell them. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Thanks, guys. So, Thanks. So, Swartz was a little aghast that the previous owner, who owned the place for 22 years, never mentioned a thing to him during the sales process. <laughs> One employee, who had been there over 30 years, said that the ghost would occasionally come up behind and say her name, or turn on the pin setters just to say hello. 
The lane's mechanic says that he often sees a dark figure hunched over the machinery in the back or walking around when no one else is in the building. So the ghost has been affectionately named Daffodil Don, D-O-N, not D-A-W-N, though no one knows his true identity. Many think he's the ghost of a loyal customer who suffered a heart attack while playing on lane one. The mechanic, on the other hand, reckons the ghost is his predecessor who lived in a house just across the parking lot from the lanes until it was recently torn down. So in any case, Daffodil Dawn has never hurt anyone or done anything intentionally scary, so they're happy just to have someone around who loves the lanes as much as they do. Hmm. Fair enough. I'm Googling this. It was a fairly recent story, something that just came out last year during the pandemic. Well, yeah, but I'm just like, I was just Googling the bowling alley, and it looks relatively new. And by relatively new, I mean like Built in the 90s or 80s, not like... Not like the 50s or 60s. Like you yeah, yeah. I don't know. I'd hang out with Daffodil Dawn. I don't really bowl very often, but that would be a reason to go. Yeah. Someday, maybe I will go back to the PUL and eat an earthquake burger and then go to uh, hang out with Daffodil. Donnie, Donnie, Donnerson. <laughs> I'm on new medications. It makes me really like... Are you on new medications every week? Because I feel like this comes up every week. No, no. This is just one I'm still adjusting to the last one. <laughs> All right. Because uh, dopamine. Dopamine. <laughs> dopamine Don. The tale of Dopamine Kate. This is the story of Dopamine Kate. Could be my... It's her turn to tell the story. We're sitting around to wait. <laughs> my turn. Um, it's your turn. Since my brother likes to gaslight me. It's not what happened. I had to find a noisy ghost. You're you're misusing gaslighting. It's because that's how um that's that really narrows down a haunting. <laughs> no one's ever heard of a ghost making noise. <laughs> so it should have been easy to find a story. <laughs> so many stories. <laughs> so poltergeist, noisy ghost, and I went with poltergeist story that I was unfamiliar with because I feel like I'm pretty familiar with quite a few poltergeist stories. After being obsessed with the paranormal since I was, what, four, five, somewhere around there. Whenever it was, we bargained with the Fae to get you, yeah. Am I part Fae or am I a changeling? I don't know. How do you feel about cold iron? Not a fan. Okay. <laughs> I read an article this morning that was, 11 ways to tell if you might have fairy blood. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Checked off all of them. Is that like the ones where they used to say 11 ways to tell if you have star child blood? And it was like, are you obsessed with the name Lee or Layla? I don't remember that one with the star child blood. <laughs> the things were like, does your skin often feel cold or is your temperature typically low? And I'm like, yes, my temperature is typically low. What the fuck? Do you have low blood pressure? Yes, I have incredibly low blood pressure. Leave me alone. These also describe a corpse, by the way. Do you have strange sleeping patterns? Yes. Does anyone not have a strange sleeping pattern? Anyone? I don't. I mean, other than, like, I go to bed at, like, 9 and wake up at 4.30 and seconds are strange. I don't take anything to sleep and I don't have to have something turned on. That's pretty unusual these days, isn't it? <sighs> I miss getting really stoned to sleep. <laughs> I actually sleep. Good stuff. Good stuff. Unless you got a poltergeist and then you'll have trouble sleeping. Look, we, we, we transitioned. Sorry, I was working on a burp. <laughs> I was ready to talk, but then things were happening because I might have pounded some vodka and cider. <laughs> Don't worry. Drinking out of a kid's cup again. All right. So let's talk about uh, this Indianapolis poltergeist, the Beck poltergeist. Are you familiar with this story at all? No, I was hoping you was going to have something to do with the Indy 500, though. Because that'd be noisy. That'd be a noisy ghost, boy. Um, No, it doesn't. Poltergeist. I'm not going to go into details about poltergeist. But this is fun because it's a German family with a poltergeist. Yeah. Yeah. So well, proper. Sort of. So this is the Beck poltergeist, which was a uh, recently, I believe, divorced woman that moved into a large house with her teenage daughter and her mother. The divorced woman, Renata, was from Vienna, which is not German. But her mother was apparently from Germany. Indianapolis, Indiana, 1962. The poltergeist activity there kind of began slowly. It started with, like, things moving around the house. Mm. And beer mugs moving around a table. And then a coffee mug jumped out of a sink. German beer mugs moving around? Well, I don't think they would have not German beer mugs. Steins? I don't know if it was a mug or a stein. They say mug, but I would like it to be a stein, so yeah. I'm going to go with that. Our story's going to be stein. Rammstein. 
the hostage. I don't. You smotherfuckers. A smotherfucker? Sheesh. <laughs> Some girls are into that. <laughs> well, I was thinking like that had something to do with jam. And oh, well, there's probably some girls into that too, but... That's true. That'd be smuckers fuckers. Do you like to toss your salad with jam or syrup? <laughs> I prefer syrup. Smothers brothers fucker? Can I do my yo-yo man impersonation in bed? <laughs> What's happening? Oh, do you not remember the Smothers brothers? Are you too young for that? I thought they were the jam guys. No, that's Smuckers. Smuckers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I take it back. I take it all back. <laughs> Smucker may be a contraction of Smotherfucker for all I know. It's true. It could be. <laughs> Do you like some Smotherfucker jam? <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> uh, okay. I expect everyone to be using that at the breakfast table at Denny's tomorrow morning. All right. Okay. Back to back to the story. 1962. We're in, we're in early March here. This source refers to the poltergeist activity as the outbreak. And I like that. I had an outbreak of poltergeist activity. <laughs> I took an antiviral. It simmered down after a few days. See, you always hear about zombie outbreaks. You never hear about a vampire outbreak or a werewolf outbreak well, or a poltergeist I outbreak. I feel like for it to be an outbreak, it has to be like in more than one spot. Yeah. Because this one spot's more like a hive. It's like a poltergeist sort. <laughs> so, uh, Middle-aged lady, Renata Beck. She lives there with her widowed mother, Lena Gamecki, I think is how we're going to say her last name. Um, and then the 13-year-old daughter, Linda. Lena, Linda, and Renata. Not in that order. Not in that order. They state they experienced nothing odd in the house until that evening when a heavy glass beer mug somehow moved on its own. Happened in the kitchen and the mug lifted out of the sink and fell behind a flower pot. Both Mrs. Beck and her mother were in the room at the time, but neither of them had been close to the glass. A few minutes later, the strange incident was followed by the sound of a loud, loud crash from upstairs. There had been a lot of robberies in the neighborhood at this point in time, so Mrs. Beck just first assumed that there was a burglar breaking in upstairs. As you do when shotgun. you have poltergeist. Just get the shotgun. The three women went to investigate, and they found a large piece of German crystal lying on the floor about four feet from the bookcase where it had been sitting, broken into pieces. They're not sure how it could have gotten off the bookcase in the first place, or how it landed four feet away. But they didn't think a whole lot about it. Until a little bit later, around 11, when a heavy glass ashtray was hurtled across a downstairs room. Half an hour later, another piece of crystal was inexplicably shattered, and they were too upset to stay in the house at this point. So they left and checked into a hotel room for the night. So uh, researchers like to point out that there was some family conflict going on at the time. Renata was 32 and was the divorced wife of a former U.S. Embassy off officer. Her daughter was shy and quite uncommunicative. Not like she was a mute, just she was 13 and hiding from all of these things, it sounds like. It sounds like both her mother and grandmother were large personalities, and I feel like if you're that child, there's two options. You are also a large personality, or you just kind of wilt away. Probably more often than not the latter. Yeah. Really. Lena, the mother of Mrs. Beck, was the wealthy widow of a German newspaper publisher who had moved to Indianapolis in 1959 following the death of her husband. The family didn't get along very well, and there was a lot of noisy and noise, noisy, noise, noise, unpleasant fight that the neighbors heard. As the events started to unfold, there was more people that became thoroughly involved in the story, including Mr. and Mrs. Emil Nostetta, friends of the Beck family. Nostetta was a respected Indianapolis businessman and an inn operator. Like, I-N-N. -N. I feel like I said that really fast. He's inoperable. But I guess after the activity started, Renata started telephoning Mr. Nasita as, like, you know, the male in their life to come help them. So they come back the next day after that first night, around 1.30. They found nothing had been disturbed while they were away. Like, you know, they're still broken shit, but it was the broken shit they left there. The 30 minutes they had been home, they heard more shattering glass. They ran from room to room, finding bowls, vases, and glassware lying broken and cracked in every room. Lena stood up from a chair where she'd been sitting in the kitchen, and a coffee cup that had been lying in the sink on the other side of the room suddenly flew and smashed against the wall, just above the chair. 
So this is when they decide to call the police. After after a coffee mug fa- flies at Grandma's head, they're like, okay, we'll call the cops, I guess. <laughs> the first officer on the scene was Sergeant John Mullen. When he arrived, he found three very nervous, agitated women in a house that was littered with broken glass plates and assorted objects. As he went around, he decided that the damage had either been caused by a hi-fi stereo or a pellet <laughs> gun. Or a, a, oh, a pellet gun. A pellet gun, gun. yeah. This is really fun because there was one small unplugged record player in the house at the time, (laughs) no pellet gun, and intact storm windows around the house. So Hmm. somebody didn't shoot the pellet gun from outside into the window. Yeah. With the police there, though, the activity still did not stop. Patrolman Ray Patton was in the house, and he heard the sound of something falling in Linda's bedroom. He went and investigated and found a glass figure of a swan broken into a number of pieces lying on the floor in the middle of the room. Other officers came. They brought high-frequency sound gear to, to detect movement that might be causing the objects to fall. Oh, they just brought in the Indiana Poltergeist Squad. Pretty start. much the Indianapolis <laughs> Poltergeist Squad. We call them the B-Team. Okay. Since they're testing the gear, like, hundreds of looky-loos start showing up on the street. Which is why they don't bring out bring them out as the A-Team. You don't want to bring them out unless you absolutely have to. Yeah. So, uh, more cops have to show up to clear the street so traffic can get through. Then after this, Renata realizes that she is missing her purse, which contained $125, which was the operating fund for a restaurant she had recently opened. Officers scoured the house trying to help her find it. No one could find it. A couple weeks after the original glass breaking, the purse reappeared. Lena found it when it she had felt the bag pushing against her leg. Only $35 of the original money remained in the purse. Just nuzzled her like a dog. Yeah, apparently. (laughs) So the activity peaked and then subsided on March 22nd. The home was left in a disastrous state. Broken mirrors, glasses, and pottery scattered about. Feathers had been torn from pillows. Pictures had been ripped from their frames. Walls and woodwork were dented where objects had been violently thrown against them. The three women were left with no answers or causes for the events as they began cleaning up. But then they were, like, not in the news at that point in time. No one really cared. They end up back in the news on March 26th when the neighbors call and they find Grandmother Lena lying on the floor semi-conscious. One of the officers was on a stairway landing when he saw the woman throw a heavy smoking tray against the wall and saw her overturn a piano bench. Based on the events that had recently plagued the house, he arrested the woman on charges of being disorderly. She was immediately under suspicion for causing all of the other recent incidents, despite eyewitness accounts of other officers who had been on the scene. Renata protested the arrest of her mother. She said that her mother was diabetic and in shock and needed medical care. The older woman was taken to the hospital where she was examined and then onto the city jail for the night. In court the next day, the judge proposed holding her for a mental examination, but agreed to dismiss the case if Lena returned to Germany within 10 days. She agreed to do so and was released to her daughter. So back in the day, if you had diabetes, you didn't like lose a leg. You just wrecked a house like Guns N' Roses in a hotel room? Apparently. This is the good old days for a reason. <laughs> I guess so. 60s diabetes rocks. So the newspapers were really amused with this. They started saying the poltergeist activity was all Lena and that they debunked all of it suddenly because one of the police officers involved, a Lieutenant Francis du- Dux. I'm not sure how we said D-U-X, Dux? I think it's Dux. Quack. Quack, quack, quack. Reported that he tried to get the spirits to come out and play, but they wouldn't. <laughs> so the research Dux did. <laughs> no, I, okay, good, because I wanted to know what he did, that's for sure. He just ran around trying to, like, helicopter his dick at these invisible ghosts. I don't know. <laughs> here goes to here. So his research was, he sat everyone in the Beck household down for an hour and a half to observe what happened. When nothing occurred, he reached the conclusion that the activity only happened when one member of the family was out of sight and away from the other. Done. Case dismissed. So these three women just got in a fight all the time and just tried to blame it on ghosts every time that the cops got called on them. Is that what, we, is that what this breaks down to? It's like when Mary got pregnant, it was like, I don't know, it must have been God. Not David with the Trans Am. <laughs> With the nice mule cart. It's a biblical trans am, right? Yeah. So, as previously mentioned, Mr. Emil Noceta had been there pretty much the entire 16 days and was able to substantiate all their stories. Finally, furniture began moving. Finally. 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 Sometimes violently. 
So Mr. Nosita says that a wall lamp was pulled off the wall. So he reattached it with a larger nail just in case it was, you know, gravity. And a few minutes later, it came down again, breaking. Mr. Nasita claimed that he was positive, like 100% sure that the women could not have caused this and that a force outside of that had deliberately broken the objects in other parts of the house while the women were seated together in another room. Police reports actually do agree with this, minus, you know, Billy Bob. <laughs> I was there for 30 minutes. Nothing happened. They also had an eminent poltergeist phenomenon researcher at the time, Dr. William Roll, and he he chronicled 110 movements and incidences in the two weeks that he was researching them. Anyway, this is considered a hoax by some people, considered a legitimate poltergeist story by others. It sounds to me like more of a legitimate poltergeist story based on the like firsthand accounts, but that's where we are. I feel like more should have happened with Linda. Fucking pubescent teenager. Possibly. I mean, that's where modern poltergeist investigators would start looking. But back then, I don't think that that was... I don't think that really anyone started to think that way until the late 70s, mid 80s, yeah. somewhere around there. So, I do have one more story, and this is one that you're at least partially familiar with. It's an Oregon story. The Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy Company B. Yeah, it's close. It's the Phantom Bugler of Forest Grove. This story tells of a lone woodsman who lived in the hills around where today Pacific University stands. He had a peculiar habit wherein if he spotted folks hunting in his vicinity, he would sneak up behind the hunter and blow his bugle loudly to frighten them. Uh, unfortunately, this habit led to his downfall. One day, while he was sneaking up on another unsuspecting hunter, he himself got snuck up on by a mountain lion which attacked him from behind. As the cougar tore at his flesh, the bugler fought back with the only thing he had at hand, his bugle. He crashed the instrument against the beast's head repeatedly, blow after blow, until finally the cat lay dead. By then the bugler had lost a lot of blood and passed out in the woods, lying there for two days. Uh, after he managed to regain consciousness, he dragged and staggered himself to his cabin, but by then it was too late and he eventually succumbed to these injuries. Over the years since, several men have reportedly been found in these woods dead, their heads caved in as though they were bashed to death by a large bugle. One man even claimed to see the bugler himself and described him as a large, ethereal man with his face torn open as if it was from an animal attack. So, I was, I was trying to find some more information on the bugler, and I ended up finding something related, but not exactly what I was expecting. So, there's no official records on any of the bugler's victims, but in February 2016, Forest Grove, the, the town, was tormented by a mysterious noise that sounded through the area. It was described as a mechanical scream. But you can hear how, under the right conditions, one might describe it as a phantom bugle. So I'm going to share this with you. Sharing is caring. So this is this is the noise that was plaguing uh, Forest Grove for the February of 2016. It's hard to find a clean... I, the original article I found had a clean audio sample, but it was hard to find again. It did sound like a bugle, but then it kind of sounded like a train whistle at the very end, but I also haven't heard like a... Yeah, I don't yeah, know. So the sound, I, the sound would only occur at night. It could last anywhere from 10 seconds to several minutes, and it drove pets crazy. Uh, the fire police, public works, they're all baffled and never did find the source of the noise. They had to tell people to quit calling 911 about it because they would start tying up the uh, emergency line. That's fair. Uh, February 27th, it just stopped as suddenly as it had started. Now, I don't know if you remember, but in the like early to mid-teens, there was like v reports around the world of various places that had phantom noises coming. I don't recall, but I believe you. Okay. Well, like, this one is from British Columbia, and this one, this one's a hell of a lot scarier, but <laughs> still, it's, it's a nice, mysterious noise one. Some 
Silent Hill shit. It is. It really is. <laughs> so that got me thinking, like, what I was hoping I could find, and I never did. What I, I was hoping I could find, like, a... Because uh, I was thinking, like, if there is a, a Phantom Bugler stories from the 19th century, and then we have in 2016 weird bugling noises then, like, is this a constant phenomenon in the area? And I scoured just, like, a ton of, like, Native American tales from that region. I hoping I would find a noise in that story, and I never did. But I just think it's kind of interesting that this area that has a ghost tied to bugling was also subject to this weird phantom bugle noise. Well, and like, in the grand, grand scheme of things, BC is not that far from Forest Grove, because that's Portland area. Yeah, yeah. But there was other ones across the world, though. That one just happened to be in the same vicinity. Well, I mean... It was probably closer to like 2009 that we took like the long way over Mount Baker into the backside of Concrete, Washington, aka a terrifying little town. And um, when we were coming down the mountain into town, we were hearing like weird sirens and like chainsaws. Mm -hmm. And those bugles, what we thought were weird sirens and chainsaws. But now I'm like, was that a bugle? Was that a bugle? <laughs> Yeah, and the, and the one from BC is particularly interesting. The video I got that from, I'll, I'll post a link to, but it brought up like, yeah, this kind of sounds like, you know, the old tales of the trumpets of heaven heralding the uh, end of days type thing. A little bit, a little bit. <laughs> Did some horses show up? Some men on some horses? Or... No. No, really sure. maybe? Anyway, I thought that was kind of interesting that there was some circling back to that having a noise tied to it. And like I said, if someone knows a native story for the uh, area there around Portland that has something to do with a, a bugling noise or a, a phantom noise, I would love to hear it because I'd love to find a connection between all those things. We can just trace that noise back through the ages. Yeah, that would be interesting. I'll report back if I hear of anything. But... Okay, you do that. So... That's uh, our noisy stories. You have a noisy drink. I have a noisy drink. I think I even have a name for a noisy drink. You might loudmouth soup. That's my nickname. <laughs> have, do you know what a buzz button is? Um, not, it's not a sex thing. Is that the thing we stole from the game of taboo so that we could like just buzz people when we were tired of listening to it? No, but I mean, I think that's just a buzzer. Okay. A buzz button is. It's a plant. It goes by other names. A smotherfucker. It's also known as a smother. smotherfucker. It's called, uh, it's also what an electric daisy is, a ting flower, Szechuan button, Szechuan button. It's not spelt like Szechuan sauce, but I think it's pronounced the same. It's this little plant, a little flowers. If you put them on your tongue, your mouth goes numb. You start salivating. As the numbness wears off, like, everything kind of has this cool feeling, and you can, there's different tastes than you would normally have with things. So, Does that make sense? Well, it does, because human uh, scent is based on a change in smells, not in what's present. So that would make sense that if you've numbed your tongue and kind of just cleaned the palate, that when you reintroduce taste, you'd pick up things that you might not expect because you'd become used to them. Yeah, so buzz buttons are, like, used sometimes in culinary stuff, especially, like people trying to give you like a very new experience. I haven't seen them commonly in a lot of places, but I have had them at like conventions. They are also claimed to make you a super taster. So I, I don't know if that actually pans out. <laughs> I don't remember from my trials with them, anything ever making me be like, Oh, I can super taste this. But I also have a really good sense of smell, so maybe, I don't know. Well, no, I've, I've, worked, I've worked wine or beer dinners when I was in the restaurant business where we would have a grapefruit ice or something that would be a palate cleanser in between courses. to kind of reset, Yeah, something to yeah. reset your taste buds. Yeah. I don't know if they actually make you a super taster, but it does definitely give you a different experience with whatever you're consuming. Mm -hmm. And I found this company called electric dust so i've had i've had buzz button the, like the whole flower mm -hmm. that's the way i've experienced it in the past but i found this electric dust it's this like psychedelic blue powder they have lollipops they have a few different products that are buzz button based so since i can't make a loud drink i'm gonna make a loud drink 
<laughs> You're gonna make a drink loud. Yeah, pretty much. So my plan here is I am going to make, and this since it's a flower, it does tend to go with things you would normally put floral botanical flavors with. So the plan here is I'm going to make a ginger lemon drop. Okay. Because the, the ginger and the citrus should complement everything really well here, including the flavors, like the, the weird taste going on in your mouth. We're making a lemon drop. We're rimming in the electric dust powder. Mm-hmm. So you're going to get some of, you're going to, it's just, it's going to work. It's going to work. But then, for shits and giggles, and to go with this beautiful blue powder, yeah. we're going to make, we have ice spheres we've made out of butterfly pea blossom tea, mm-hmm. which is I think I've, I'm sure I've talked about it before because I'm mild. Our very, our very first drink used it. The rooftop lady used it. Well, that was that had butterfly pea blossom in it, but that was not strictly what it was. This is just a plain butterfly pea blossom tea. Okay, but the concept the concept's going to be the same. Concept's the same. So it's this beautiful blue flower that produces this light flavored tea, nothing too aggressive. And if you add acid to it, citrus works well for this. It starts turning shades of purple, magenta. I think it can get to a bright pink if we throw enough acid in there. Mm -hmm. Don't think that's going to happen. Haven't put the the balls in the lemon drop yet. But I'm going to make a little little ode to Daffodil Dawn here (laughs) with a big blue ball, like a bowling ball. And we're going to have a butterfly pea blossom ice sphere in this lemon drop with the ginger and the electric dust rim. And I was going to call it the sound of silence unless you've got a problem with that. I don't. That I, I, I expected a little pushback on that. Okay. I mean, I wasn't ready I'm, to I'm, argue it, but I expected pushback. I'm feeling a little sick. I don't have all the fight that I have in me normally. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Fuck that name. That name is stupid. We should we should call it Scarsboro Fair. Is what it should be called. What's the band on the Muppet Show? What's their the Doctor Hook and the Electric What now? Hold on. Electric Teeth? No. Doctor Teeth and the Electric. Dr. Teeth and the Electric Mayhem. Yeah, that was it. I mean, I'm fine with calling it the Electric Mayhem also. There's your pushback. Hey, I pushed back. I'm a contributor. Are you an influencer? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm just going to start telling people I'm an influencer. I don't know if I'm an influencer. More likely an enabler would be the uh, proper term. I'm 100% an enabler, but I'm going to tell people I'm an influencer. We start that. Can that be our new hashtag? Enabler influencer. I mean, it's it's like our our friend Chris told me the first time we ever met. Were you like a courtesan in a past life? Because everyone around you just has this like feeling that they can do whatever makes them happy with no judgment, no regrets. <laughs> I'm like, sure, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> we both encourage that kind of mentality. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, do it. I want to watch it. <laughs> Yeah, hold on. Let me get my drink first. <laughs> hold on, hold on. All right, camera's running. Now you can do it. <laughs> I guess that'll wrap up things for this episode then, right? Are we Wait, are we doing this? Well, we'll figure that out. Sound of Silence, Electric Mayhem, Electric Silence, Sound of Mayhem. WCW Mayhem? Yeah. So we got to figure out what to do next episode, I guess, then, huh? Yeah, do we have any holidays coming up we need to focus on? Well, Independence Day is coming up, so we could do... Firework ghosts. Firework ghosts, revolutionary ghosts, colonial ghosts, founding father ghosts. You don't sound real excited about any of this. British ghosts. British ghosts. Attack ghosts. (laughs) Junkyard ghosts. Blacklight attack. We can can do a, yeah, revolutionary colonial ghost. That means that does limit our... Our area, I feel like, but that's fine. Well, isn't that the goal? I mean, isn't that the idea to limit it? It's probably for the best. Can you make a drink on that concept is probably the most important thing. Uh, Yeah, because I can just, you know, throw a Boston Tea Party drink together. There we go. I don't know what that is. But I'll probably have pea blossom tea in it if I were to guess. And I'm going to dip my balls in it. <laughs> Revolutionary Ghost, next time on the Booze and Spirits Podcast. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. You know they're making new Kids in the Hall episodes. <gasps> they're filming nine new episodes for Amazon Prime. They're so old now, but I'll I know. <laughs> I can't wait to see 
60 year old Gavin. <laughs> I think you had to say something before I realized Glenn on Superstore. Oh, is Mark uh, McKinney. Is Mark McKinney. I'm like, no. <laughs> no. Oh, yeah, he's just kind of old and chubby now. <laughs> I mean, I don't think Dave Foley has changed a whole lot. Well, he's, he looks a little old. A little, a little bit. I mean, he's got white hair and gained a little weight, but that's about, that's the extent of it. But otherwise, he just looks like a few years older Dave Foley. I don't know. You probably didn't see Postal, did you? Because of Postal, I forever in my head have the image of Dave Foley wiping his dick off on his shirt tail because he played some cult leader and his character's introduced climbing out of bed after he's just spent the night with several women. Oh. Sure. <laughs> so, so full frontal Dave Foley wiping his dick off on his shirt tail. Check it out. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> I don't know that I need to see that. <laughs> And, like, part of me wants to watch that movie, but that description... Mm, my child might be. There's a lot of derping going on. I hear that. Anyway, check out our show notes. I will put the video that I got the bugling sounds from. Somebody did a, a nice piece on that and also a couple other noise phenomena. 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 Check out our show notes. They will have that. They will have the recipe for the... Noisy Mayhem Sound Machine. Noisy Mayhem Sound Machine. <laughs> Silence. Balls. <laughs> as well as links to our website, our links to Apple, Google, Spotify, in case you're currently listening to this on something that you hate. We have ways you can support us on there. Links to Patreon, support through Anchor. Um, merch. Merch. We have merch. From PT Public. We're saving up for Theo's lobotomy. Yes, very much so. I need to figure it out. There's ways that people can like leave us voicemails via Anchor that we can put those voicemails into the show. But are they going to do that? Probably not, but I, mean, I need to figure out how that works. Not that it matters mm -hmm. the 12 people who are listening. So let's wrap this up then. Uh, remember to drink responsibly and in accordance with your local laws. Don't end up our next ghost. Tell a poorly conceived story about you. I'll just make shit up. It won't be on a, like a cohesive timeline. <laughs> we'll all be out of order. We'll mispronounce all the names. And we'll make fun of you. What a douche novel this ghost is. Your 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 cocktail for the episode will just be like a goat cheese fizz. Like <laughs> Katie's eating apple again. I guess we should. Sure. Go now. Bye everyone. Okay, bye. <laughs> I missed you already.